Welcome everybody to The Great Dictators, Studies in Love and Hate. Why is it that so many of these hated dictators in our history are at the same time so much loved, often by the very people that they oppress? My name is Peter Vronsky, and I apologize for the last minute change from live lectures to recorded lectures. I suddenly found myself unpredictably on the move, and I'll explain that in a minute. For those who are taking a course from me for the first time, um, I'll introduce myself to you and I'll tell you a little bit about myself today, the several lives I uh, lead and the life I led in the past, as often my lecture topics are connected with my personal experiences. I am a foremost a historian. I earned my degree relatively recently in 2010 from the University of Toronto. Uh, history PhD in the fields of the history of espionage in international relations and criminal justice history. My doctoral dissertation was on the intelligence failure of the Canadian Secret Services during the 1866 American Fenian invasion of Canada from the United States by Irish Nationalist Republican Insurgents, the Fenian Brotherhood, and the hidden history of what would be Canada's first modern battle fought near Fort Erie, Ontario on June 2nd, 1866, a year prior to Confederation. Penguin Books published a version of my dissertation as a trade book under the title of Ridgeway, the American Fenian Invasion in the 1866 Battle that Made Canada. For those interested, it's available anywhere books are sold as a paperback, an ebook. Um, the limited run of the hardcover edition is available on used book websites. As a historian, I lecture at Ryerson University, teaching there the history of international relations in the 20th century, um, I guess into the 21st century as well, the history of espionage, history of terrorism, of the American Civil War, the history of Nazi Germany. I have a second life as a forensic investigative historian and author of several bestsellers published in the United States on the history of serial homicide and its investigation. Um, and, and I guess um, certainly serial homicide and my knowledge of it makes me qualified partly to lecture on dictators, as most of them can certainly be described as serial murderers, um, missionary type serial killers, or perhaps even in some cases, so-called power hedonist types of serial killers. In any regard, my first book was Serial Killers, The Method and Madness of Monsters, which has been described as the definitive history of serial murder, at least by my publisher, um, female serial killers, how and why women become monsters, Sons of Cain, um, a history of serial killers from the Stone Age to the present, and going into release in a few weeks this coming February 9th is my latest book, American Serial Killers, The Epidemic Years, 1950 to 2000, which explores the surge of serial murder that reached this unprecedented peak between 1970 and 2000, when more than 80% of all 20th century American serial killers made their appearance in this short 
30 year period. So the book looks at the ramp up starting from the 1950s. For those of you um, who took my lectures last year, uh, last winter on the history of serial murder, you know that those books were inspired by my brief random encounter when I was 23 years old traveling to New York City with a serial killer in 1979. I briefly encountered him as he was fleeing the scene of a double murder in a Times Square area hotel in which I was coincidentally attempting to check in. In what became as the Times Square torso killings, he had beheaded two women, set their torsos on fire, and then fled with their severed heads and hands in a bag. The heads over the last 40 years since the murders have never been located or recovered. One of the women in room 417 was later identified, but the other victim remains um, unidentified to this day. And that is what essentially suddenly thrust me a few weeks ago into the prospect of being on the road um, for what is going to be essential travel this winter in the middle of this COVID crisis, just as our lecture series was about to begin. So I am pre-recording these lectures for you that um, otherwise I would have done live from my home studio. Um, I have no idea where I will be when you are listening to this um, lecture. But um, as you know, I am involved in, in this case. A New Jersey man, a married father of three small children who commuted daily to New York City for his job as a computer operator at Blue Cross Insurance was eventually arrested as the notorious Times Square torso killer, or sometimes called the Times Square torso ripper. His name was Richard Francis Cottingham, and he was eventually convicted in five murders in New York City and in New Jersey, and sentenced to life imprisonment plus 350 years. Uh, but you don't need to worry, he um, may get a third of his sentence reduced for good behavior. He obviously remains and will remain incarcerated for the rest of his uh, life. Cottingham had in fact committed as many as 80 murders of women and girls in New York in his home state of New Jersey, many of them have remained unsolved, um, in particular, many near his home in Bergen County across the river from New York. And so several years ago, um, an opportunity was arranged for me to reunite with this Times Square torso killer that I had so briefly encountered back in 1979 and meet with him in prison for an extended visit. I established a rapport with him and was invited back by him to visit with him frequently in the Trenton State Prison, the New Jersey State uh, Prison, which I have been doing. As he is um, now in his mid-70s and finds himself in failing health and facing his imminent mortality, Cottingham has begun talking about some of the unsolved cold case murders he had committed in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, and so I've been at this process on and off between my home here in Toronto and uh, coming down to New York and New Jersey. I 
began working with a number of cold case homicide squads, including that of the NYPD and the Bergen County's prosecutor's office, um, reviewing many of their cold case murder cases and assisting them in mapping some of the locations where Cottingham stated he buried severed heads and other body parts in an attempt to recover them and possibly still identify um, victims through forensic facial reconstruction. So it has been an ongoing uh, process. We halted it last winter, again, during the COVID crisis, but um, unfortunately, serial killers don't exactly um, concern themselves with COVID or, or um, other factors when they kind of spontaneously often sometimes choose to confess. Um, in 2010, after um, 30 years of silence, essentially, Cottingham pled guilty to an unsolved murder from 1967. And again, those of you who took my course last winter know that I had just returned from the United States after I had made a highly publicized announcement that last year in January, Cottingham had confessed to three more murders of schoolgirls in 1968, 1969, some 50 years ago. The total number of his murders has you know, been confirmed at nine now, but he claims 80. So we have quite a lot to go. And about three weeks ago, just before we were to begin these lectures, Cottingham has agreed to confess to another, um, another series of, of murders and um, facing the prospect of having to deploy to the United States um, on a very erratic schedule in these difficult times. So I, as I say, I don't know exactly where I'll be when you're hearing this lecture. Um, in any regard, I hope that rather having to take in a live lecture at a specific time, you enjoy the flexibility of online pre-recorded lectures that you can access through the website Life has shared with you. There you will find a link to my email where you can send me questions and I can post and attempt to answer some of them on that same website in writing or maybe even incorporate them into future lectures uh, that I'll be recording. Again, my apologies for this last minute change in the format of the lecture course. Prior to entering graduate, graduate school in the 2000s to study history, I had worked for about 25 years witnessing history with my own eyes as a television news documentary cameraman and field producer, a first in Toronto, later throughout North America, and eventually overseas from South Africa to Russia and uh, Chechnya. And it's on an assignment to the breakaway Republic of Chechnya in the 1990s that I had a close encounter personally with a dictator, the only dictator I had any kind of face-to-face -face encounters in, in with. And, and so perhaps I'll start off describing to you this particular dictator and the kind of currents in history that brought him into power and out of power. He's probably an individual um, that very few of you um, heard of. His name is um, General Jokar Dudayev. Chechnya is a small territory 
located in the Caucasus in the um, oil-rich region between the Black and Caspian Sea. Um, I arrived there shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union on um, the eve of the Russian invasion when low-intensity fighting was already underway between independence movement Chechen clans and those clans that were backed by Moscow, um, who um, were essentially attempting to suppress the independence movement. Russia had attempted to deploy Soviet troops by air, but the Chechens blocked them at the airport. They hijacked some of the military helicopters, and I ended up embedded with a rebel clan ostensibly shooting a investigative documentary for CTV and Discovery Channel on the subject of the smuggling of nuclear arms material materials by the Chechens. This, of course, was one of the phenomena emerging out of the breakdown of the Soviet Union as all these weapons suddenly as republics like Chechnya, like um, you know, Armenia, Azerbaijan began to break away, but of course there were nuclear missile installations, factories and so forth still located in these um, regions and sometimes this material fell into um, unauthorized hands. You're looking actually at a photograph of, of me in a captured Soviet helicopter that um, the Chechen pilot there behind me is uh, learning how to uh, fly. It was quite a roller co coaster ride. I think he crashed it uh, maybe seven times before um, I, I figured I used up enough of my nine lives and, and jumped off the thing. I was based in the capital of Chechnya, uh, Grozny, which in Russian means terrible. It was one of those typical um, dusty Central Asian Soviet era cities almost frozen in time in, in the Soviet 1960s. But I grew fond of it, its markets, its boulevards. Um, I worked out of a suite of offices in the only hotel in Grozny, the Kafkas Hotel, which you see at the right of the picture. I, I had a room there on the top floor with a balcony overlooking the main square um, and this basically Main Street Grozny and overlooking the presidential palace where, um, which I would become familiar with and with the Chechen dictator who inhabited its upper floors, General Jokar Dudayev, the lone wolf as he would be nicknamed. Eventually, um, we were invited across the street into the palace to meet Dudayev, taking an elevator up to the seventh floor, which was heavily fortified and guarded. And uh, then we were escorted up a stairwell to the eighth floor where Dudayev had his office and where the elevator doors were sealed and welded um, shut. Dudayev, um, on meeting me, was perhaps a little bit fascinated by me. Uh, you know, what a Canadian who spoke fluent Russian was doing in Grozny, a, a, certainly a far and um, uh, 
lost corner of the planet. Um, hardly any Westerners had come to Grozny since the revolution of 1917. And of course, Dudayev as the leader of oil-rich Chechnya. In fact, Chechnya is was, um, I guess, and is still now since it's conquered, um, a major source of a, a high-grade oil that was used for jet fuel by the Russians. And, and, and so um, Dudayev was very interested in the Canadian oil industry, which to my shame, I knew so little about. Nonetheless, Dudayev would invite me back on ceremonial occasions in the palace, presidential parties and important sessions of his cabinet. And um, I filmed there often. I would not claim he was a friend, but he was somebody I became acquainted with, with his henchmen, his bodyguards, his Praetorian guard and entourage. And eventually Dudayev invited me and an Italian business partner to tender an offer to build and furnish an independent television network for Chechnya. My first impression of Dudayev was there was a certainly a commanding serenity about him. Um, he he was a former general in the Russian Air Force. In fact, he was the only Chechen to rise to the rank of general in the Soviet armed forces. He appeared to me to be dedicated to um, his country, his people. Um, I could sense this kind of admiring loyalty among his bodyguards, his his entourage. But somehow, you know, that comes natural, I guess, with with their their role. Um, I would not describe him necessarily charismatic, but when he spoke in his own language, in, in, in the Chechen language, um, which I did not understand, I could see he expressed himself very differently than he did when he spoke Russian. We conversed in um, Russian, and, and, and he... Again, not understanding what he was saying, I could still see that once he went into his own language, his own culture, there was a degree of charisma obviously affecting the people who were um, observing him and um, listening to him, who understood him as, 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 as a Chechen. And um, I... I Prior to arriving in Chechnya, I had never met Chechens, not to my knowledge. Um, in fact, I, I had to get out a map when I was told I was going to Chechnya. Um, I had to get out a map and, uh, you know, look where um, Chechnya was actually located. I had never heard of this place. Dudayev, as a dictator, certainly was going to be a product of Chechen history under another dictator's regime. Um, he's a dictator spawned by a dictator. Um, and, and of course, the dictator I'm referring to is Joseph Stalin, who, of course, we'll look at further down in the course. Very shortly after Dudayev's birth in 1944, Stalin had suddenly ordered the entire ethnic Chechen population to be deported from Chechnya um, to various remote regions in Soviet Asia. All this happened on a single day, February 23rd, 1944. 
um, and it's still known in Chechnya as Black Wednesday. Anyone who refused to board trucks and trains um, and depart Chechnya on Black Wednesday would have been put to death by the dreaded Soviet secret police and the troops of the NKVD, a predecessor agency to the KGB. And this exile, deportation of the Chechens is one that deeply marked their history and indeed is, is a formulative event in Dudayev's childhood. Once Stalin died in 1953, the entire Chechen nation essentially um, walked, hitchhiked, rode um, any way they could get back home from exile. And, and, and so they did. The exile lasted approximately um, 11 to 12 years. But Again, it, it, it marked the Chechens, and it as well left a large Chechen diaspora that um, not only spread throughout Russia, but also into Europe and into the Middle East. The Chechens are um, Sunni Muslims, but they practice a small sectarian mystic a form of Islam known as Sufism, the Sufi mystics of the sacred circular Islam. It's maybe a little reminiscent of Christian Baptist gospel singing services. Um, there's a lot of... Um, exuberant celebratory singing and uh, dancing incorporated in uh, Sufism. They uh, dance in this circle known as the Zikr, sometimes referred to in colonial literature as a dance of the dervishes. Unlike um, many current Islamic societies, both Shiite and, and, and Sunni, certainly um, Chechen Sufi Islam had a lot of less hang-ups about um, dancing or um, about women. Women um, appeared to be more integrated into Chechen society, into Sufism, um, although they modestly wore head scarves, um, uh, the scarves rarely covered their hair completely. They danced openly with uh, men and Chechen women as well fought with them in battle and often served as rear guard uh, auxiliary troops. You would see a lot of particularly elderly women often armed with AK-47s backing up the frontline men in, in battle. We ourselves um, ended up embedded with these Chechen rebel clans that were backing Dudayev. We came to know many of them personally. Um, we were often invited to their homes and met their families. In fact, we became so deeply embedded that we were eventually given our own AK-47 automatic assault rifles and grenade launchers that myself and my sound man took to carrying with us along with our camera gear. In the 90s, especially in the former Warsaw Pact and Soviet war-torn regions like 
Nagora Karabakh, Chechnya, and Yugoslavia. It was no longer safe to be a neutral journalist, nor did we have the ubiquitous body armor that journalists will later wear. Uh, press immunity and neutrality certainly helped protect, pr protecting you. Uh, a fully loaded AK-47 helped a little bit more. Like many Islamic people, the Chechens were a most hospitable people, and invitation for dinner at their home inevitably meant you'd be staying the night as a guest, and they would hustle and bustle over you to ensure your comfort. Despite the integration of women outside in public at home, strangely, women were more segregated, serving the meals, but never sitting down at a table with the men and, and, and their, their guests. As you can see from this photograph, um, alcohol would be copulously served at the table. Chechen Islam resembled the more easygoing Islam of the kind you might have found until recently in Turkey. It was not unusual for Chechens to stop for a shot of vodka on the way to the mosque or smoke a joint on the way to prayer or on the way back. Cannabis was uh, co uh, copious and the Chechens actually thought they were the only ones in the entire world who smoked weed and were shocked to find out they were not. So it was, they were certainly from my point of view, a pious uh, people, but not rigidly prohibitive um, in the way I found other Muslims in different parts of the world in, in, in that part of the world. Dudayev himself um, grew up in exile from Chechnya. Chechens themselves are ruled by an array of clans and alliances of clan. Each clan is about 150 to 250 uh, people. And so many in his family and in his clan served in the Red Army and the Air Force. And in fact, for some reason, Chechens excel as combat pilots. There's, as I say, a large Chechen diaspora and for example the Jordanian Air Force today even today um, is dominated by um, Chechen pilots um, who began serving in the Jordanian military shortly after the First World War shortly after you know Jordan was founded probably through British oil connections as um, of course, Burton had a mandate in um, uh, Jordan, as they did as well in um, Iraq and in uh, Palestine. And, and as well, there was a very strong British oil company presence in Grozny, in Chechnya, on the pre-Soviet era Chechen oil field. Um, of course, all that ended as well with the Russian Revolution of uh, 1917. After um, the family returned to Grozny, Dudayev um, completed an education as an uh, electrician, but eventually he enlisted in the Soviet Air Force. He was a talented pilot. He rose through the ranks of the Air Force and eventually was admitted to the elite Yuri Gagarin Military Aeronautics Academy. And um, Dudayev will rise to the rank of Major General, as I say, the only Chechen general uh, 
in the history of the Soviet armed forces. Dudayev will marry a, a Russian woman, Alla Kulyakova, the daughter of his commander in the Air Force, a colonel when Dudayev was only a um, lieutenant. Alla is a poet and a painter, um, and they will have three children, two sons and a daughter. She'll call her husband Duki, I guess for Dudayev, Duki. I saw Dudayev only once with his uh, family, and, and he appeared to me, certainly in that brief um, private moment I saw him in, as a, as a doting, loving father of his um, kids. And, and on the other hand, uh, you know, um, Stalin appeared that way as well as... Uh, many dictators have, as, as did Saddam Hussein with, with his sons. Dudayev um, served and was highly decorated as a bomber pilot in the war in Afghanistan. He earned um, the Order of the Red Star, which you could see on his uh, right breast. Um, a, a, a high award. Um, he um, essentially was bombing guilt-free the Mujahideen, something that of course will later raise eyebrows when he'll call kind of on um, Islamic solidarity in Chechnya in his declaration of independence for, for Chechnya. Um, some of the more um, conservative uh, Muslims in uh, Chechnya kind of questioned Dudayev's um, adherence to Islam, you know, considering that he had no problems, as I say, serving in the Air Force, bombing fellow, fellow Muslims in um, Afghanistan. But, uh, you know, again, the, the, the Chechens were very kind of loosey-goosey about um, Islam, at least before the, the, the big war. Um, after the war in Afghanistan, when Dudayev returned to the Soviet Union, he was now put in command of a strategic nuclear bombing, bomber squadron in Tallinn, in Estonia, on the front line essentially facing the NATO alliance. The only thing that stood between um, the USSR, of which Estonia at that time was a part of, and um, the uh, NATO armed forces in West Germany was, of course, East Germany and, and uh, Poland. So he certainly was on, on the front line of, of what would have been uh, the border of the Soviet Union at that time. It's here in Estonia that General Dudayev suddenly rebelled or found the rebel in him as the Soviet Union began crumbling. In 1989, Gorbachev held the first um, democratic elections inside the Soviet Union, and um, particularly in the Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, which had been occupied by the Russians in 1940. 
um, shortly after the Russians and the Nazis invaded Poland and um, shortly before the Germans betrayed the Russians with Operation Barbarossa and invaded Russia, the Russians seized these Baltic states, which at one time prior to the First World War had been part of the old Russian Empire. And so there was always a strong independence movement in these states. And, and in the wake of um, these democratic elections of 1989, um, nationalist Lithuanians, Latvians, and Estonians were elected at home to office. And by 1990, they were beginning to assert their independence, uh, clearly toward breaking away from the Soviet Union. And of course, this was something that the Russians had not anticipated and uh, began to clamp down on with, with force. Um, and uh, there were, in 1990, clashes, particularly in um, Lithuania and in uh, Estonia. Um, Dudayev was not only the commander of a nuclear bomber squad, but as well, he was the most senior Soviet commander in Estonia. And at one point in 1990, he was ordered by Moscow to seize and take control of the Estonian television network. He refused. And suddenly, Dudayev threatened to close the airspace over Estonia to any Soviet deployments coming from Moscow. It was a double act of both rebellion um, and, and mutiny, an extraordinary act for someone who had such a long career and such a senior rank in um, the Soviet Air Force, in the Soviet military. And I often think of, you know, when I think of that serenity that I had described to die of having, it is a kind of a commanding serenity of somebody who um, commanded a force of nuclear weapons, all that destructive uh, power. It, I, I, I think there is a certain personality type um, to whom that kind of power might be um, given. So, so uh, you know, it's an aspect of Dudayev's uh, persona having exercised already um, the power to unleash that kind of thermonuclear destruction that he could have. From this point on, as Dudayev rebels against Moscow, but not at home, in Estonia, um, the story gets muddy and obscure. Popular legend in Chechnya has it that Dudayev was called back to Chechnya by a delegation of Chechens who asked him to come home and run for the office, at, uh, for the office of president of Chechnya um, in those democratic elections that were being held throughout the Soviet Union beginning in 1989. Um, others claim that Dudayev actually fled home to Chechnya, fearing that he would be arrested for disobeying orders or for mutiny. It's not even clear when Dudayev resigned from the Soviet Air Force, um, when he did appear in Chechnya in May of 1990. He still wore um, his uniform from the Red Air Force. Um, but once arriving in Chechnya, he began 
forming alliances with hundreds of those clans that govern the political foundation of Chechen society. As the Soviet Union started coming apart uh, around the edges as Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia um, were pushing to break away from the Soviet Union as um, the wall in Berlin came down in November of 1989 as the Warsaw Pact countries began scattering um, old school dinosaur reactionaries in the Communist Party in Moscow arrested Gorbachev while he was on vacation in um, the south of Russia and attempted to seize power in August of 1991. And of course, this seizure of power was a spectacular failure. It was the end, essentially, of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. And within four months of that failed coup, the Soviet Union itself would cease to exist. When the old Chechen communist leadership failed to condemn the coup, Dudayev suddenly, in September of 1991, with his clans, attacked the parliament, seized it, murdered the Chechen Communist Party leader, and took power. It happened almost out of nowhere and completely unexpectedly. Suddenly, he emerged as a dictator, despite the fact that he had not lived in Chechnya since his enlistment in the Soviet Air Force in the early 1960s, some 30 years earlier. But indeed, suddenly Dudayev became a dictator in this coup d'etat with unchecked power constitutionally, although typical of many dictators that we'll see, he later staged a referendum um, in which he claimed that Chechens had almost unanimously approved his seizure of power and for him to continue in power as he was. Dudayev ruthlessly put down his opposition using the remaining vestiges of Moscow's former local KGB facilities and local Chechen personnel of the KGB to imprison, torture, and murder any opponents to his rule. In October of 1991, Dudayev declared Chechnya as a sovereign independent state and ceased oil deliveries to the Russian petroleum cartel. Instead, began negotiating the sale of crude oil himself and shipping it out through um, the Republic of Dagestan next door, just to the east of um, Chechnya, down the Caspian Sea to Iranian oil brokers, or through Georgia, which itself was breaking away and rebelling um, from the Soviet Union. So through Georgia uh, to the Black Sea and out through uh, Turkey. In November of 1991, the Russians attempted a species of a, a, a Bay of 
pigs um, invasion with pro-Moscow Chechen clans, but again, Dudayev put them down by force. And in response, Dudayev warned the Russians that he would send Chechen suicide warriors to blow up nuclear installations near Moscow, Leningrad, and other major Russian cities. He was very much becoming, in Russia, public enemy number one. And it was around this time that I arrived in Chechnya. Dudayev had seized Russian military bases, equipment. He took control of nuclear missile silos and launch sites. When I was taken on a tour of these missile installations, the missiles were gone and the silos were stripped of um, the launch garricks, but it wasn't clear whether the Russians had dismantled them previously prior to leaving or whether the Chechens had seized them. In any regard, my assignment in Chechnya was to infiltrate and film nuclear weapon material smuggling rings of which there appear to be plenty. Although to this day, I'm unsure whether what we were viewing was actually nuclear weapons material or merely a con. Um, there were at that time a flurry of reports of the interception of nuclear weapon, weapons material flowing um, across the Black Sea into Turkey and through Eastern Europe, um, in particularly a highly mysterious substance, more valuable per weight than gold or cocaine called red mercury, which was um, supposedly a key element in the production of nuclear, um, nuclear warheads. Um, red mercury was this, this kind of dense um, mercury-like bright or, or dark red actually s substance that it was explained to me um, slow down a kind of um, you, you know the fly of neutrons as, as atoms are splitting um, kind of slow down the process so that a detonation can actually build up. Other, it, otherwise, it, it will quickly um, dissipate. And so the documentary that was I was working on, which eventually aired on Discovery Channel in the U.S., CDV here, and other networks around the world, um, was called The Hunt for Red Mercury, um, a play on that uh, Tom Clancy novel, um, The Hunt for Red October, about the submarine and the movie with Sean Connery. In Chechnya, I found a kind of palpable mix of both fear and fear of and admiration for Dudayev. Uh, and its intensity really depended upon whatever clan one belonged to. Um, there was no fear to speak out um, personally to criticize Dudayev, and, and, and certainly there were some clans I encountered that um, were very critical of, of Dudayev, but of course it, it was fatal to try to speak in, in uh, you know, a large public venue against Dudayev or to even, you know, to certainly to attempt to cross him or in, in some ways to uh, um, 
Bridges powers that would have been fatal. And, and Chechens were mysteriously from the opposition um, disappearing in, in uh, Chechnya. In kind of a Saudi Arabian oil management style policy, Dudayev shared the new incoming oil revenues with his fellow Chechens, with the population. Um, almost every um, adult male family head in uh, Chechnya was given a share in the revenues that Dudayev was collecting from the sale of, of oil. Um, I Everywhere I saw, people were busy renovating their homes, building new ones. Uh, mosques were under repair. You must remember, of course, that in atheist Soviet Union, um, all religious practice was um, discouraged. Um, and, and um, you know, that may have something to do with kind of the easygoing uh, vodka drinking Chechens. In fact, that um, there was a, as they say, a discouragement of um, any kind of religious practice in the Soviet Union, but the mosques existed. Some of them appeared to be um, not particularly ancient mosques, but they were decrepit. And I saw them, you know, most mosques, at that period were, um, had scaffolding around them and work was being done. There were new roads being built, um, stores were filled to the brim, brim with consumer goods that um, I was not seeing in um, Moscow when I, I, I flew into Chechnya via Moscow. And, and so, uh, you know, certainly the stores in remote, dusty Central Asia, Grozny, were much better stocked with um, goods than, than stores in uh, Moscow. So there was this kind of unusual and sudden affluence in, in Chechnya. These oil revenues, of course, was something that Moscow claimed as their own. By now, Yeltsin was in power, and the pressure on Dudayev was, was mounting. Technically, Chechnya was not exactly part of the Soviet Union. It was part of the largest republic in the Soviet Union, the Russian Federative Republic, or as it was known, the Russian Federative um, Soviet Socialist Republic. And um, the Russian Republic, of course, had no provisions for secession in the way the Soviet Union did. Um, the secession of the Ukraine, um, the Baltic states, uh, Belarusia were technically legal under the Soviet constitutional systems, under the system of the USSR. But the Russian Federative Republic was the biggest of all the republics, and it was essentially Russia and has become what is today the Russian Republic. And so Dudayev in this period found himself um, fighting off these strange um, nighttime in, in incursions. There were raids from neighboring republics that were still part of Russia, in particular from uh, Dagestan. Uh, in, in, in fact, um, I saw some combat between uh, Dagestanis and, and, and Chechens that wasn't reported anywhere. And um, 
you know, it was a difficult documentary to work on so remote. Um, and, and I had a number of clients in Chechnya, CNN at one point was one of them. And um, as things were happening in, in, in uh, Chechnya, uh, it was very difficult to explain to um, news producers in Atlanta, Georgia, where CNN was based, what, you know, not only what exactly was happening in Chechnya, but where even Chechnya was. Um, you know, I, at one point I had this kind of conversation on the phone, um, you know, can, can you, uh, do you have a map there? Um, can you put your finger on Miami? Can you find Florida on the map? Okay, you got your finger on Miami now, move it right, keep going, keep going across the blue part. And, and I would guide them over the phone to more or less where, where Chechnya was located between the Black and Caspian Seas. So very little was coming out of it. It was, was like working in a black hole. The pressure um, kept mounting on Dudayev. Um, and he began to adopt a military siege mentality, essentially marshalling every man, woman, and child, including his own adolescent son, to prepare for something big that was going to come. And in this period, Dudayev will survive two assassination attempts, one by a sniper who will miss, and then one in which Dudayev's car is actually blown up into the air and lands overturned, wheels up on its roof, and yet Dudayev and his escort will emerge unharmed. And this too sometimes is a theme in the stories of dictators. Um, attempts sometimes are made on their lives and rather than signaling to them that, you know, danger is awaiting, the fact that they often escape with their lives becomes to them kind of a sign of providence that they are meant indeed to rule. I, I, I think probably um, one of the um, most attempted assassinations um, after Castro was uh, on Adolf Hitler. Um, I don't know how many dozen assassination attempts there were um, right through the last one of July uh, 20th, 1944. And every time Hitler would uh, survive an assassination attempt, he it further convinced them of uh, kind of his manifest uh, destiny. Nonetheless, um, Dudayev now dug in to his, um, into his palace. You can see just in front of the door, there's an armored vehicle standing there. This became a permanent fixture in front of the um, palace doors. In December of 1994, in the early part of the month, the Russians finally bombed the Grozny airport and they destroyed the Chechen Air Force, which consisted of planes and the helicopters that Dudayev had seized from the Russian Air Force. In response, Dudayev declared war on Russia. And uh, then began almost immediately negotiating an armistice with the Russians. But before December was out of 1994, um, the Russians then launched a major invasion of Chechnya uh, 
and um, the siege of Grozny uh, began. And um, Dudayev's fortified palace within several months began to look like this. It was reduced to rubble. This became one of the heaviest deployments of the Russian military since the Battle of Berlin in 1945 to bring down Nazi Germany. Um, like the Reichstag, the presidential palace became kind of ground zero of the battle for Grozny. Um, the population, of course, of Grozny, which not only consisted of Chechens, but there was a very large um, minority of Russians living in Chechnya as well. Many have been there since the 19th century conquest of the Caucasus. Other Russians arrived there um, during the period that Stalin had deported the Chechen population. Stalin had deported them essentially because he thought that they were disloyal. Um, and in particular, he felt that as the Germans were pushing towards Stalingrad, because certainly the Germans would have had to go through uh, Chechnya to arrive at the Caspian Sea and Baku and where you know all the Russian oil reserves were. That was what the Battle of Stalingrad was about. And, and Stalin felt that the Chechens wouldn't, you know, couldn't be counted upon remaining loyal to Moscow against Nazi Germany. And so in 1944, even though the Germans had been thrown back, Stalin made the decision to just deport every man, woman, and child on one day out of Chechnya and kill anyone who remained, and which he did. In fact, Chechens took me out by helicopter to these remote villages um, where Russian NKVD uniformed NKVD troops, the secret police, um, had entered these villages and, and just massacred everybody, leaving behind these um, the villages kind of looked like these medieval mountain villages with stone towers. The Russians essentially pulled down the towers, killed everybody there. There were um, small mass graves around these villages. There was no road going in. The only way to get there was either by foot or by, uh, you know, camel or donkey um, or, or, in our case, helicopter. Uh, but, um, you know, this was a cruel genocidal period in, in, in Chechen history. And now it was repeated once again in the 1990s with this horrific um, destruction of, of Grozny. The palace um, was reduced to rubble under relentless aerial bombing and uh, ground bombardment. Um, essentially nothing of the Chechnya that I first saw on my arrival remained in the end. And very few of my friends survived this, this war. Um, they were mostly all killed. And the city, the entire city, was essentially leveled in the way that, again, we haven't seen since um, the Second World War. And both, as I say, Chechen and Russian population came under equal fire and were essentially dispossessed, lost their homes and ended up on the road as refugees or trying to eke out some kind of living in the rubble. Dudayev um, himself eventually made his way into the mountains. Um, 
where he fought on for another two years. Eventually, the end would come on April 21st, 1996. Using technology that was supplied now by the United States, Russia used a system to track the signal of Dudayev's satellite phone. Um, the signal could guide a missile launched from an aircraft down the signal's trajectory to the phone from which it was emanating. The problem was that while the Russians knew Dudayev's basic location, um, it would take about 10 minutes to launch a plane and arrive at that location when a telephone call would begin emanating um, a signal. And so Dudayev normally kept his calls very short. I think he knew this. He understood this. And, and, and so the Russians kept missing an opportunity short of just keeping an aircraft permanently in the air. They, they, they could not get to um, Dudayev um, as, as he kept his telephone calls under 10 minutes. But on April 21st, 1996, Dudayev entered into a entered into negotiations for an armistice with a member of Russian parliament on his satellite phone as he stood by his vehicle in this remote mountain road that led across, I think, towards the Georgian um, border. And the conversation went longer than usual, and this proved fatal to Dudayev. Um, the Russian plane arrived on time and launched two missiles that went down the trajectory of the satellite signal and killed him on the ground as he spoke on his satellite phone. And so ironically, the same Russian Air Force in which Dudayev had dedicated most of his life to serve in ended up killing Dudayev. To this day, Nobody knows where Dudayev's body is buried. And there are many Chechens um, and even Russians who believe that Dudayev is actually still alive in, in hiding. He is loved by an older generation of, of Chechens who remember that brief Dudayev dictatorship um, and remember it fondly. And many of them almost have um, this kind of supernatural belief that Dudayev will return almost like a messiah to eventually liberate Chechnya. His wife, Ala, and three children were on site, um, she actually saw her husband killed, but the whole family survived. Ala herself was, um, after Dudayev's death and the end of the war, Ala and the family were um, captured by the Russian forces and Allah ended up very brutally interrogated uh, 
by a KGB officer. Um, it was called the FSB by then um, Alexander Litvinenko, who, of course, will later betray his future master, Vladimir Putin, and he'll defect to England, where he will be murdered with a dose of polonium in his tea in the London uh, sushi bar. Um, Alla and the Dudaya family eventually were allowed to leave Russia. They, um, I think they spent some time in Turkey, but then eventually settled in Lithuania and lived in Lithuania for quite some time, uh, but apparently are recently on, on the move again. Most of us have never heard of Jokar Dudayev, but a number of European countries have honored his memory. In um, Bosnia, Herzegovina, there's a street named for um, General Jokar Dudayev, and, and of course, um, Bosnia and Herzegovina um, is a predominantly Muslim country and, and fought um, the Serbs, who, um, of course, were Russian Orthodox nominally, the way the Russians were. So there's a kind of affinity between Bosnians and Chechens. And in fact, there were a lot of volunteer Chechens fighting in Bosnia against the Serbs during those Balkan, um, uh, Balkan wars. Um, Estonia has um, a large room in the Barclay Hotel that once used to be Dudayev's office when he was stationed in the Baltics. Um, there's a Dudayev memorial plaque there. Um, in Georgia, in Tbilisi, the capital, there's a street name for Jokar Dudayev. Um, Latvia, in Riga, there's as well um, a street name for Dudayev, Lithuania, you know, for what Dudayev did in defending the sovereignist movement in Estonia. Certainly he is um, fondly remembered in the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, um, Estonia. Um, in Poland, in Warsaw, there is a roundabout, again, named for uh, Jokar Dudayev. Um, in Turkey, numerous locations have been named for him. And in the Ukraine, even, uh, there's um, a, a uh, pro-Ukrainian volunteer battalion that was named after Dudayev and was actually led by a former Chechen general. Isa Munayev and um, a, a street in uh, Lvov named for Dudayev. So there are people outside of Chechnya that admired Dudayev. We, as I say, um, have not heard much about him. It's unfortunate that Dudayev's experiment in sovereignty came at such a terrible price in two wars. Um, the second waged by Putin in the early 2000s, which effectively installed a very brutal puppet regime, which returned Chechnya to captivity. Hundreds of thousands of Chechen men, women, and children perished in this near genocidal war. And perhaps um, if Chechnya was not oil rich, if Chechnya also was not on 
the route for major pipelines, gas lines, and oil lines that the Russians um, built towards Europe. Perhaps Chechnya could have gone on its own way, but of course, um, oil, we know the power of oil and the kind of curse it can sometimes bring to a people. And, and certainly it did that for the Chechens. It, it ended up being the raison d'etre for their deaths and the destruction of this society. The end result as well um, was that those easy, that easygoing Chechen nation of um, Sufis Muslims who, you know, would take a shot of vodka on the way to the mosque, um, it was over. Uh, Chechens now became hardcore Sunni jihadists that some make Al-Qaeda and ISIS look like a day at the beach. And Chechen female warriors now don veils and hijabs. Um, they strap bombs to themselves, blowing themselves up in Moscow railway stations and subways, um, taking hostages, the so-called Black Widow, Chechen female terrorists. And, 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 you know, I think it is that old proverb, there are no, um, you know, there are no atheists in the trenches. Um, you could perhaps say there are no atheists in the genocide as, 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 as well. The, the end result of all this was essentially the radicalization of the Chechen nation, which through its clan system is very cohesive um, and has a very cohesive diaspora. Um, when, again, I was working in Chechnya, I was offered all sorts of uh, goods from snake venom to uh, diamonds. And um, whenever I um, it said, well, you know, I've got a long way to go to get home. I, you know, I don't want to be smuggling snake venom diamonds or, um, or, you know, the crates of AK-47s that they were offering. Um, the reply often was, uh, oh, don't worry about it. Um, wherever you are, there's a Chechen and, um, We'll make sure that this is waiting for you when you get home um, in, in, in Toronto. Just go find the Chechens in Toronto and pick up whatever you buy here from us. And, and um, there was a kind of a sincerity uh, and honesty among them that, you know, that I had no sense that I would have been ripped off if I had entered these, these deals. But as I say, um, it's it changed and whether we can blame the dia for this or or the russians or history often you know there is no one to blame dictators come to power and they come to power on the wave they ride it like you know uh, uh, almost on a surfboard often acting with a sense of destiny not necessarily uh, planning anything but acting on instinct and I think Dudayev partly did that um, but you know it changed the Chechen culture it changed the people who they were and certainly in the U.S. Um, as well um, a bitter marginalized Chechen refugee named in the honor of Jokar Dudayev. Jokar, I uh, 
Tsarnaev will be along with his brother, one of the perpetrators of the Boston Marathon uh, bombings. And so, as Che Guevara said, uh, cruel leaders are replaced only to have new leaders turn cruel. Um, despotic SARS spawned a despotic revolutionary by the name of Lenin. Um, Lenin begat Stalin and Stalin begat Dudayev. At the same time, um, you know, in some ways, Dudayev begat the cruelty of Yeltsin, which begat the cruelty of Putin. Yeltsin, um, remember Yeltsin is also a product in a way of Stalin. Yeltsin was born in 1931 raised through the brutal collectivization and um, fantastic purges that Stalin had uh, perpetrated. We all um, hailed Yeltsin as a great democratic savior of Russia, um, a left, leftist politician who argued that Gorbachev's policies were not liberal or, liberal or democratic enough that Gorbachev was not going far enough. And Yeltsin, of course, became this opponent of Gorbachev, became the president of the Russian Republic within the Soviet Union, and he became this oppositional force in the Russian Republic government against the Soviet government in the Kremlin. They were, you know, maybe a um, kilometer and a half apart from each other. Um, imagine, you know, if our federal parliament was located in Toronto instead of Ottawa, um, and there were two parliaments, there was the provincial parliament in um, of Ontario and our federal parliament of Canada, and they became, um, you know, became rivals, which is precisely what happened um, after 1989. And so when in August of 1991, those um, old school reactionary leftovers from the old Soviet system attempted to seize back power with a coup d'etat, um, the people stood up. Barricades went up. And the voice of authority against this plot, this coup d'etat, launched by a junta inside the Kremlin began to coalesce around the Russian parliament, the White House. And it's here at the barricades of the White House that we saw that summer Yeltsin emerge as this great figure. It's the first time we begin to see the old Russian imperial flag, the white, blue, and red banner appear, representing the Russian Republic, as opposed to the red banner with the hammer and sickle on it that flew over uh, the Kremlin. And um, Yeltsin, in this heroic moment, defended the change that had come under Gorbachev since he took power in 1985. These six years of what Gorbachev called glasless, openness, open criticism, um, sunk in deep enough that um, the people stood up and Yeltsin, as they say, 
became this great heroic um, figure at that moment. It was through Yeltsin's inspiration that the very military that was sent out to put down Gorbachev and all the reforms and restore the totalitarian dictatorial system, the dictatorship of the proletariat, um, that the military even rejected it. And, and Russian soldiers began to raise the, the, the Russian imperial flag as, as, as well. The sign there reads, um, Yeltsin, the people are with you. Um, and you can see there's a hammer and sickle with an equal sign to a swastika. And so this was a great moment. Um, and of course, Yeltsin saw it through. He um, brought down the Communist Party. He banned it in the Russian Republic. He essentially put an end to the Soviet Union. But, you know what they say, uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Within two years, this is prior to Yeltsin unleashing that genocide in Chechnya. Within two years, Yeltsin will betray Russian democracy and the very parliament that he stood to defend uh, when Yeltsin became greedy for power um, and made a sudden unconstitutional grab for dictatorial power. And when the Russian parliament attempted to impeach him, Yeltsin this time unleashed his tanks on the parliament and ended bombarding it into submission. And that essentially in 1993 ended Russia's very brief experiment with democracy. It was over already as Yeltsin had seized power, but um, Russia had this very brief breath of air between 1989 when uh, people ran in free democratic elections and 1993 when those elected officials were just bombarded out of the parliament by Yeltsin's tanks. And so um, the dictatorship returned, whether the dictators were monarchs, tsars, or whether they were um, dictatorships of the Politburo, or whether they were, as the Russians termed it, um, cults of personality, the way Stalin was. Uh, Russia essentially has always been ruled by dictators, and it left a deep mark on this country. It, um, you know, Yeltsin's tanks and his bombardment of the parliament and his submission paved the way for Russia's current dictator, Vladimir Putin. And so in our next lecture, I'll begin our exploration of other dictators, dictators I have not met, uh, them all uh, I haven't. And, and um, we'll look at um, what drives them to power, we'll see the circumstances under which they gain power, um, we'll um, look at when we know their psychopathology, um, and try to look at them as well from the viewpoint of their own people, what was it about them that actually the, you know, made them so popular and loved again um, by the very people they repressed, despite the grief they caused. So 
I look forward to um, sending you the next lecture next week. And I hope you all have um, a good week. Stay safe and um, feel free to email me through the website. And I'll be back next week.